Hello, Abby. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Our good friend Joe Navarro had recommended that, that you would drop by and to chat with us. Uh, he certainly has brought up your research, and we were fascinated in, in going through your research for this show. There's a lot of ideas that align, and we're certainly excited to hear some of the science behind some of the body language communication that we have been preaching on this show for the last 15 years. Hey, I'm excited to get started. <laughs> so we'd love to just kick it off and to get to know a bit about you. What was it about body language that got you interested? I think it was because human beings are so complicated and so individual that you can't say that anybody has a particular personality type or people do things for certain reasons. You know, they're so difficult to understand. Yet body language is a universal language. It's something that we've carried with us through our evolution and we all share certain traits and characteristics and we all do similar things for similar reasons unconsciously in terms of our body language. And I just thought that's incredible that we can identify these common patterns when everything about human beings seems to be completely different. Um, and I got really interested, as everybody does when they start looking at nonverbal communication, lie detection. Um, everybody wants to be a human lie detector. And it took me some time in the field of studying lie detection to realize there is no such thing as a nonverbal cue of deception. Um, I wrote two research papers trying to find cues for deception. And we actually, I mean, the studies were really interesting because we took a really unique approach to the way we looked at body language. But what we were actually just seeing is high stress, high stress and discomfort. And then I changed my perspective when I was doing my PhD to look at cooperation and creating a positive environment so that people feel safe and feel comfortable and feel familiar with you, that they want to share information with you. And then it kind of opened up a whole world where everything seems really positive and you realize, wow, human beings are so cooperative and that is you know what we have evolved to do we've evolved to cooperate that is how we've survived and I think especially in academia I've always thought of um, everything is quite dog eat dog and I know that business most of the time people say you know leadership is dog eat dog but it really isn't um, because it, it is all about cooperation and trust and creating a positive environment for your colleagues and your employees and that's how you get to the top by working with other people cooperatively. And that really is the key to successful relationships, and successful business. Well, we are certainly huge fans of cooperation. And I know trust is something that a lot of us have this internal barometer around, but what is trust defined from a scientific perspective as? So this is an interesting question because scientists have this way of making things very confusing. Um, and they take these, these concepts and then they pull them apart into, okay, well, what's cognitive trust? Okay, what's effective trust? What's behavioral trust? What's this kind of trust? And they really pull them apart and make them individual, but they overlap in so many different ways. And I just think that it's overcomplicated. And the way I see trust is safety. You know, if we feel safe, if our brain says you are not a threat, I trust you. If I feel that I can be vulnerable and you won't exploit me, that's trust. Now, how quickly can trust be built if we look at it from that lens? So trust has evolved to be very, very quick from nonverbal communication. We actually judge trustworthiness in 33 milliseconds. So it's literally the first judgment that we make about anybody before confidence, uh, before competence, anything is trust. And it can be... We can perceive someone as trustworthy very, very quickly, but we can also perceive someone as untrustworthy, just like that, just as quick. Even if we've made that initial judgment of trustworthy, all they have to do is one thing and our brain says, no, not safe, and then it's gone. So it depends on, again, the kind of trust that you're looking at. If we're having an interaction now, we have a one-time interaction, then all your judgments are based on me in this one interaction. But then if... I am very, very trustworthy. And you think, you know, I trust you. You seem trustworthy. And then we have another interaction and I behave slightly differently. All of that trust that's built up is gone. So to answer your question, it can be built very quickly 
it can be built over a long period of time and it can be destroyed very quickly and it can be destroyed after a long period of time if you've had this very very long lengthy trustworthy relationship one thing one simple thing and it can be broken down just like that with our clients one of the main points to building trust that we discuss is what after they come through they feel very good about being more vulnerable and being more open with new people because they learn its power so they want to communicate and build that trust with everybody and what they find after they have gotten comfortable with their vulnerability that other people aren't so comfortable with their vulnerability and what i tell them is that nature is going to play its course and everybody has a different rate of how and, and look for different things in order to get comfortable with people. However, the one thing that you can't do is you can't push nature, you can't expedite it, but you can remove the hurdles that are in the way for people developing trust. And for a lot of people, they think that it is an additive steps in order to build trust with people when in actuality it's removing a lot of the the things that are getting in the way and keeping people from easily getting comfortable and building trust yeah and that's one thing that um i think people get wrong that they think that trustworthiness is a toolkit you know we can talk about non-verbal behaviors to show right. that untrustworthy or behaviors to show that untrustworthy acts and you know the way that you speak and things and they think that they can apply these and use them and then form this trustworthiness and then put them down and then go off and continue with their lives. And that's not what trust is. It's not a set of steps that you can just follow and then it's done. It's something you really have to embed. You can't just say, okay, well, if I smile, they'll perceive me as trustworthy and that's it. And, you know, I'll apply these things at the beginning of the interaction and I don't need to worry about them later. If you're doing the behaviors at the beginning, you stop doing them, I'm going to stop seeing you as trustworthy. Just like if I, like I said before, we interact once, I see you as trustworthy, another time, I don't. It's not a toolkit. It's a set of things that we understand can create a perception of trustworthiness. But one other thing that creates trustworthiness is consistency. We as human beings, we need consistency. It makes us comfortable. It makes us feel safe. Because it's predictable, it's not uncertain. And if we're interacting with someone and we don't know how they're going to be towards us, are they going to be angry? Are they going to be happy? Are they going to be sad? Are they going to be this? It creates uncertainty and it stops us feeling so safe in that interaction. And if someone is inconsistent and they're using these behaviors as a toolkit, they put them down sometimes, pick them up sometimes, put them down another time. We don't feel safe. We, don't, we can't predict how we're going to interact with them. So you're exactly right. And it is one of the most common mistakes that um, I think people make in the field of trustworthiness. Now, you mentioned something earlier about as humans, we are cooperative, but there is this misconception that it's dog eat dog. So can you talk a little bit about why trust and cooperation are important from an evolutionary perspective and why it is that we are predisposed to cooperation? Yeah, so I think this dog eat dog perspective comes from the survival of the fittest. You know, I need to beat you so I can produce offspring and it's this competition. But survival of the fittest isn't about the traits that make you as an individual survive. It's about the traits that make the group that you're in thrive and survive. So those traits that enhance cooperation and build trust, those are the traits that flourish and those are the ones we've evolved to have. And if we think that we've evolved in this really uncertain environment where there's threats everywhere you know there's a predator here there might not be my next meal here so having these group relationships has helped our survival because we can rely on people and um, they can hunt for us they can protect us all of these things that are just essential also reproduction which is quite self-explanatory that we need other people for those kinds of things and we need to be able to identify who we can cooperate with so the one way that we've done that is we've evolved these nonverbal communication tactics of showing trustworthiness. So rather than just saying, hey, um, you know, I'll cooperate with you, we need to instantly be able to detect who was cooperative. So we have evolved these behaviors which say I'm trustworthy so we can pick out who to cooperate with. And there's a lot of argument on this topic that, well, that can't be the case because people could use these tactics. 
and pretend to be cooperative and just show these trustworthy behaviors and actually be um, a deceptor, be deceptive. But the thing is, because we are a cooperative species, that non cooperator isn't going to last very long because in our social group, we have gossip. So if someone isn't cooperative, all it takes is one person to say they didn't cooperate and then the whole group know they're a non cooperator So we don't need to look for you know, tactics of these cues of deception. That's not what we've evolved to look for. We've evolved to be quick and look for trustworthiness. And we see it in modern day now. You know, if you want to go to a restaurant, what is the first thing that you do? You look on Google for reviews. You look for what people have said about it. If you're getting into a new relationship and you know that they know a friend, first thing you do, what are they like? Tell me about them. Have they done anything wrong? Because we count on the gossip of other people. And we see it in celebrity magazines and all of these things. We, we thrive on it as a species because that's when we get our information about you know, who is deceptive and who is trustworthy. And that's why it's so important not to view this, as you said earlier, as a toolkit, because your reputation builds trust. And if you're just turning it on and turning it off with certain people that you view as high value, you know, we use use this example in, in class, how you treat the janitor is exactly how you should treat the executive of the company because your reputation matters. And that consistency is huge to building the trust that you're looking for. Yeah, and you see in corporate a lot of the time, and people say, oh, well, you know, it is dog eat dog because they're this way and they're up at the top. They're doing amazing and they're not cooperative and they stand above people. And it's like, well, that that doesn't mean that cooperation isn't the better way to go. They might be successful with their manipulative tactics, but it doesn't mean that they wouldn't be more successful if they were cooperative people are successful all the time using negative tactics but just because people are doesn't mean that is the only way to get there or the best way to get there just think if that person who is at the top for being manipulative decided to actually become trustworthy and be cooperative imagine how much better they could do and what you do see around people that have got that way and got to the top without being trustworthy and without being cooperative you see this bad reputation around them. You see lawsuits and you see complaints and you see unhappy staff. You see staff that don't enjoy their jobs and staff that don't enjoy their jobs. What means, you know, a non-cooperative work environment, a non-productive work environment? Yeah, I, I think, especially if you've experienced that environment, you don't thrive in a manipulative, untrustworthy environment. So. Although you may see that person leading, you may also find that's not the culture that you want to be a part of or a company that you want to sustain working for. Yeah, if you don't feel safe when you go to work and you feel like you can't be yourself around people, you can't relax, or that you know you have to do everything perfectly, you know exactly how your boss wants it, that puts you so on edge and it doesn't motivate you to do your best. That motivates you to just get by, keep your head down and get on with the job. That's not what we want our employees to feel. We want our employees to go to work and strive to be their best for themselves because they enjoy being there for their colleagues and because they respect their leader, not because they fear their leader. Now, with trust being built quickly, I'd love to talk about these nonverbal cues that we're evolutionarily wired to look for around trustworthiness. But yeah, so it starts with a smile. We know how important the smile is. And the smile truly is a social signal. Think about when you go bowling. Um, When you hit a strike, you stay completely straight faced. When you hit the strike, it's only when you turn around and see people that you smile. You communicate, I'm excited, I'm happy. That's what the smile has evolved to do, to communicate, to communicate. I'm not a threat. I'm happy. I'm happy to see you. This funny thing happens when we see a smile and see a true, genuine smile. So when the upper cheeks are raised and we see the Dutchman eyes, um, it releases it releases oxytocin, um, and oxytocin suppresses that fight or flight instinct where we say, you know, I might not be safe. I need to go, or I might need to go. The smile relaxes us and just says, you know, no, it's safe. It's fine. Um, and any behavior that could expose a vulnerability 
So we've evolved, like I said, in a really dangerous environment. Um, and one part of our body that we protect is our throat, which is why when we see things that scare us or when we hear bad news, a lot of the time we, we put our hand to our throat without realizing we protect our throat. Or if something has, you know, we've had horrible news, we often kind of stroke our throat and it's that instinct to protect when there could be, you know, a predator or something that could harm us. So when we want to show that we're trustworthy, we kind of lean our head to the side to do this head tilt and we expose our neck because we're exposing a vulnerable part of our body and saying, you know, I don't think you're a threat. I'm not a threat. Here's a vulnerable part to show you that I'm not a threat. And dogs actually do that too. And I think this behavior was first mentioned in Charles Darwin's book on the emotions of man and animals. Um, and he noticed it from his dog. And we saw certain behaviors in his dogs. And then it kind of, you know, we started to learn, oh, humans do these too. Um, and then we really started to figure out, you know, this is a signal to say, I'm trustworthy, it's safe. And also anything that is very open, so things like open postures and open palms so if I'm talking to you I have my palms facing outwards you can see what is in my hands I haven't got a weapon my hands are behind my back your brain says "Uh oh <laughs> there could be something there in the hand so always making sure that you are facing someone um, and have your palms out and showing you know I'm not hiding anything from you and this is also why people that hide information or hold back information can be perceived as untrustworthy. So when we tell kind of half truth and we hold a bit of information back, and bosses do this all the time where you know there's some bad news, but they're not really telling you everything. It's that we don't know what it is that they have. So our brain says it's, it's the worst it could possibly be. So we feel uncomfortable. We feel unconsciously that they are untrustworthy. Because it's that same feeling of there could be a threat there. I can't see that there isn't a threat. So my brain says there is. Well, what's so interesting in, in the work that we've done over the last 15 years is that we'll tell our clients, hey, smiling is important. But internally, they feel like they are smiling all the time, yet they're not openly expressing that full face smile. And it takes us actually filming them and showing them the video for themselves to show the discomfort that they're showing in these situations where they're feeling a little bit of social anxiety, some tension and pressure. And once they realize just the simple change in that smile and showing it early and often as you communicate with someone, it leads to an entirely different interaction. So we're also wired to respond in turn and mirror back that smile and bring energy to our communication when we feel the other person is bringing that smile in and showcasing us that trustworthiness. So it really changes the tenor of the entire conversation. Yeah, it's emotional contagion. So if someone is showing you, I'm smiling, I'm happy, I'm really excited, you kind of get just instant more energy from interacting with them because you take on some of their emotions. Just like we have all been in a conversation with an energy drain where you are excited and they are so just mellow and their tone of voice is mellow and their behaviors are mellow. And then you just start to feel tired. It's the same thing. It's just that we mimic people unconsciously. And through that, we take on their emotions and we can't help it. it again, that's an evolved um, behavior. And that's what I did my PhD in, unconscious mimicry. And it really does work through emotional contagion. So I read this article a while ago and it said um, that people that show some anxious behaviors are perceived better. Um, and I don't know where they got the science from, that if we interact with someone and we show that we're anxious, that perceived as more trustworthy and makes people more comfortable. And that really isn't the case because when we show that we're anxious, they feel anxious, they take on that anxiety. So right. especially in the field of nonverbal communication, there is so much rubbish out there. And this is an example of some rubbish that's out there. And, you know, we, we do have to be very careful about what we read because these kinds of things, there's other ones about, you know, you can tell people's personalities by how open or closed their posture is and things. And when we take this misinformation, it causes us to interact with people differently. So if we perceive someone as hiding something because they're crossing their arms, we're going to interact with them like they're hiding something. Or if we see someone as being defensive because they're showing certain behaviors that we 
misinterpret as defensive, we're going to start making them defensive by the way we talk to them. So we have to make sure that um, we're being careful of one, how we interact with people because of emotional contagion, because we're passing them our emotions, but also because there is a lot of misinformation that we have to be careful how we are interpreting their behaviors and responding. Yeah, I think it's far more important to focus on what you're communicating outward than to start like you did, seeking out deception, lie detection, and reading all of this into nonverbal communication. Sure, that would be great if we could just look at someone and instantly get a 100% accurate read on them. But what's far more impactful is actually modulating our own behaviors, showcasing these trustworthy signals with everyone, making it a part of our personality to build and grow trust with others, knowing that it improves our reputation and improves our communication. And of course, through cooperation, it gets us ahead in our career. For a lot of people as well, the ideas that they, they come to us for, and certainly for the men, they want to learn to approach women, and then, but also in a networking event to be able to walk up to somebody that they're interested in talking to and make their pitch. And, so, and, the, and for the ladies as well, as they want to be able to break the chains of their social anxiety and walk up to folks that they find interesting and, and chat with as well. And due to that, Without them realizing it, what they end up doing before they come through and learning about this is they go out of their way to make the other person uh, feel that they can trust them, that they're not up to something. So what they'll do is they'll put their hands behind their back to show that I'm safe and they'll shrink themselves. And all of those behaviors, as you mentioned, give off a different vibe to the person that they're talking with. And they're now uncomfortable and so they leave and it's fascinating how easily we pick up on others body language which also brings uh, me to this point that you mentioned about how we're going to mimic the, uh, the micro expressions that are going on and we can and we see those when we're dealing with people but this is something that we're now learning that we have all this technology and I can't read the micro expressions on your face through zoom, through the technology. And so these interactions are almost, they're very surface level. Yeah. I'm talking with my mom and, and we have this opportunity to chat via across the country, but it's not like I'm sitting with her uh, on the couch and and our the nature takes over and we're mimicking in each other to understand and have an empathy to, at a face-to-face -face level. Yeah, I, I mean, I move away from micro expressions um, as it's not really an area that I place myself in. Um, I look more at what we can observe and things that we, we can see and assess for. But virtually, what I have found is it doesn't actually affect how much you can create trust. We can create trust and cooperation exactly the same virtually. It's just people aren't used to it because our brains have not had to deal with this. We are, well, our limbic system is still, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago reacting to that kind of environment. We didn't have laptops back then. So it's all very new and we don't really know how to respond. So we act in a really unnatural way like how we are now, face on, that's not natural. When you usually have a conversation with someone, unless it's at a restaurant, typically you're, you're more to the side. It's not actually, if I stood straight on with every conversation, it is quite intimidating. But yet we do that online. And again, that is picked up as a bit of a threat. And we typically stay really rigid as well. We don't move so much. And that rigidness, creates untrustworthiness. We don't do the head tilts. And again, untrustworthy. And what people tend to do online is they don't have much of their upper body showing. They'll have their face really close to the camera or just kind of the camera way down looking out. And we create trustworthiness and comfort through our body language, through our facial expressions. If you are in a really dark room or have a really bad camera or the camera is at a really weird angle, I can't see your face expressions clear enough to respond to them. So it's not that we can't, it's that we, we don't realize how effective it still is virtually, so we do it wrong. And as well, we actually have more of a power virtually because we have more control. Yeah, we don't have the lower body anymore, which takes away some power. 
However, when we're interacting in person, we are in this moving environment where there's so much to control for and so much to think about. If we are virtual, I have complete control over this square that I'm sat in. I have control over what's behind me. I have control over what I'm wearing and how I act, how much you can see and the light, you know, how close I am to natural light, all of these things. So it actually is almost easier to create trustworthiness. And one thing that I always do is I have plants behind me because when we see greenery, especially leafy plants, it slows down the nervous system and creates calmness. Um, Also light colours, just a nice white background, whereas a lot of people have really bad lighting. Or one thing that we see a lot that is really bad for trustworthiness is the filters that people put on their cameras. Yeah, where they have the the background. I was in a meeting um, and someone had a Lego house and everything they were saying, I was trying to concentrate on what they were saying, but I was just thinking, you're in a Lego house. I can't stop looking (laughs) at that area around them. I kept staring at it and it takes our attention away from what they're saying. And our limbic system has not evolved to deal with this kind of stimuli. So it's distracting and it's confusing for our brains to have this kind of interaction with these things um, in the background. So we just need to be aware of the power we have virtually to create this um, cooperative and trustworthy atmosphere um, and really, you know, think about it for our meetings. Well, I know with Zoom and even in this interaction, I've shrank my own screen many of us will get caught up in staring at ourselves and then become even more self-conscious instead of being direct with the camera, removing the view of self. Obviously, when we're interacting in person, unless there's a mirror behind the person you're interacting with, very rarely do you see yourself think about your own body language movements and, and how you're communicating. But Zoom has created that feedback loop, which often robs our ability to listen actively to convey the trustworthiness that we're after. Now, you did talk about the lower body being cut off. I'd love to talk about what are those nonverbal signals that we're sending with our lower body that do help in building trustworthiness. Um, So a really interesting study that I've recently done is looking at the power of the lower body to create perceptions of approachability. So we talked about this orientation facing someone and orientating towards them. And we know from research that when you orientate towards someone, you're perceived as more approachable, you're perceived as more warm and inviting. And I wanted to see if, okay, well, what about the lower body? What if my upper body is facing towards you, but my lower body is facing away? And what about my foot specifically? Because we know that the lower body has an effect because studies have shown that the feet are honest. So when we're nervous, the rest of the body is saying, I'm fine, but the foot is tapping away because we think that people can't see it. So if we're trying to control for our behaviors, we think about my face, my hands, my upper body, but we don't think, okay, I've got to control my feet. We just kind of let them do their thing, which is why I was really interested to see if the feet carry any effect. And what I found was that using a male and a female individually um, as targets, so they had their upper body facing towards um, an observer, lower body either facing towards or facing away. And Lower body facing towards, they were perceived as approachable. Lower body facing away, they were perceived as unapproachable. Statistically significant. But what was interesting is the sex of the target didn't matter. Sex of the observer didn't matter. What also didn't matter was how introverted or extroverted the observer was. The only thing that mattered was the foot orientation. And it just shows, you know, tiny behaviors moving my foot towards or away from facing you can change how approachable I'm perceived. And that's incredible. And I did another study recently, and it actually came out with this open versus closed gestures that I've been talking about. But the finding was accidental because I wanted to see people's lower bodies when they were uncomfortable. So when they were in an interview and the interviewee, um, the interviewer was, you know, a bit out of order, said something too personal, something a bit derogatory that made the interviewee uncomfortable. And what we saw was this sequence of people make themselves small with their lower body, 
when they're uncomfortable, they bring their knees together, they tuck their feet below their chair. But it, it's important the sequence that occurs. So if I tuck my feet by my chair and then keep my knees out, that doesn't actually indicate discomfort. It's doing a number of these behaviors. So bringing my knees and keeping my knees and then tucking my feet and then keeping my legs closed, things like this, where you see multiple closing gestures. That's what indicates a discomfort. And interestingly, behaviors that we do associate with discomfort, like um, we have blocking display. So we kind of put our hands on top of our genitals and we feel attacked and we kind of protect ourselves. Um, and we, um, a lot of the time, we do cross our arms when we feel attacked, but it isn't indicative of it. And that, that's a mistake. But it is something that we do, but it doesn't mean that when we do it, that is what we feel. Um, but we saw these blocking displays in all groups, comfortable versus uncomfortable, because of the context. So it was the interview causing some discomfort displays, but the tucking of the feet and the bringing the legs together, that was only to do with the interviewer making them uncomfortable. So again, it speaks to this um, importance of recognizing what displays actually mean. If we said, you know, any time they show a blocking display, they're uncomfortable and making them feel this way. If we just went off of that and said this one behavior means this one thing, we would interpret it differently. We'd interpret it wrong because we don't take the context. And it's the same virtually. Interviews create more discomfort. So we're likely to see more discomfort displays. So does a virtual environment. If somebody is showing anxious displays regularly, despite you showing trustworthiness, doesn't necessarily mean you're making them uncomfortable. If everything else is saying, I'm comfortable, I trust you, but they are showing, you know, a couple of displays, we see those behaviors in a virtual setting because it is unnatural. We just have to take it in the bigger picture. Are all of their behaviors or most of their behaviors showing me discomfort? Or is it just one? And then everything else is saying comfort. Because if it's just the one, that's likely to be their pacifier. That's likely to be the one thing that's their outlet. You know, I twiddle my pen sometimes or, you know, a lot of people tuck their face or jiggle their foot. And that's their pacifier. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with what you said. It's all the other behaviors that you have to take into consideration as a whole. And I think that's why it's so important for everyone to understand that, again, putting more emphasis on the signals that we send understanding that we actually have some power. We can get people to mirror us. We can add energy and trustworthiness to any interaction versus the opposite, just observing and looking to read people based on these snapshots and tiny signals that we read online mean, oh, this person doesn't like us or this person is untrustworthy. It just doesn't really add up effectively to reading communication. It's better to start looking at yourself and projecting outward the confidence, the trustworthiness that we need to build better relationships, to build cooperation. Now, this begs the question, can we overcome distrust? So can trust be rebuilt? If we've made a mistake, if we've showcased untrustworthiness, or maybe we had a bad day and we didn't show up the same the previous way that we had shown up in interactions, can we rebuild trust? So we can rebuild trust, but it, it depends on what broke the trust. And it depends on how you go about rebuilding it. And because people just say sorry. And sometimes an apology is enough. But an apology has to be appropriate for the condition. So if, say, um, you embarrass me in public, and we're really good friends, loads of trust, you embarrass me in public, and that trust is broken down, and you want to apologize, a simple apology isn't going to be enough. It has to match what broke the trust. So you taking me into your office privately and saying, I'm really, really sorry, likely isn't going to be enough. It has to match that embarrassment I felt. I have to feel like you're doing something that makes you feel vulnerable or you feel embarrassed that matches how I felt. Otherwise, that apology actually has the opposite effect. So we just have to make sure that we take into consideration what broke the trust and the way we go about getting it has to equate to at least what broke the trust. Because if it doesn't, and it's not enough, it doesn't just not work. It actually has negative consequences, but it brings the trust even lower down. So those really quick, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't mean to, I'm really sorry. And we just throw them out thinking, oh, you know, it's better than nothing. It actually isn't better than nothing. 
it's a lot worse than nothing because it reduces the trust even more. So it sounds like in order to rebuild trust, we have to understand how the trust was lost. It's not something that we can flippantly rebuild and it needs to match at least the way our contrition needs to match the way the person felt in their losing trust for us. Yeah, and we just need to remember sorry isn't better than nothing. Don't throw around those stories, I won't do it again, sorry, because that can reduce the overall trust and it can reduce your perceived trustworthiness in general too. So we have to make sure that, you know, that saying, don't tell me you're sorry, show me you're sorry. Now, it really is important that your behaviors say, truly, I am sorry. And I'm going out of my way to do something that is negative for me to show you how sorry that I am. There has to be some kind of cost to yourself. Because that, that's what an apology has really been designed to do. To say, this is negative for me. This is something that I don't want to do. I'm having a negative consequence for doing this. So I'm doing it to show you how willing I am to gain your trust back. So if that story doesn't cost you anything, then it isn't actually showing that you really want to rebuild that trust. Right. So it doesn't value the relationship in a way that would rebuild the trust. Now, what strikes me from all of this is the consistency that we need in our nonverbal communication. And what we've found with a lot of our clients is Nonverbal communication is not something that many people even think about or are conscious of. So we use video work in our classroom to really showcase and highlight some signals so they can start to clue themselves in and be a bit more conscious. So in listening to this, we heard a lot of nonverbal signals that are important for trustworthiness. Where do you think our audience should start if they want to start bringing these nonverbals into their communication in a more consistent manner? So I think it all starts with education, because like you said, you know, there's so much to learn that when we are focusing on ourselves and focusing on them, trying to decode them and display, it's too much that it becomes uncomfortable. We do eventually have to realize that it is a system, that we observe others and assess theirs and respond correctly and then show us. So it is this cycle where we have to understand it. But unless we start by first, OK, understanding what do signals mean, learn what signals show trustworthiness and really go into the science, read the literature, read the research and start you know, figuring out how to improve yours. Start implementing it, start seeing a change and then start trying to assess for others. But it starts with education and it is a difficult process because learning anything is uncomfortable and we think, oh, body language, easy. But it is like learning a whole new language. We have to figure out what things mean and it's complicated because different cultures have different things that mean different things. So depending on, you know, what gender, what culture, what context or environment uh, interacting with people is going to change how our nonverbals are interpreted. So we have to just start somewhere, start with the basics, start reading, start getting educated on the displays and then start implementing them. Well, I love that linking it to verbal language because you don't get fluent just from reading a couple books and doing a couple workbooks. You get fluent from actually implementing and practicing the language, the tenses, etc. Same thing with nonverbal communication. You get fluent by bringing it into every interaction you're having, not just picking and choosing on the job interview or the first date or when you're in the elevator and you're pitching someone. But instead, look at it as something that you can practice and hone in every interaction that you have and what I love about it is you do get that back because of the power of mirroring. When you're adding these new nonverbal trustworthy signals, people start reacting to you differently and it energizes you and it adds to the communication versus what many of us who aren't conscious of our nonverbal communication, we're getting into boring small talk situations. We're taking energy from the interaction and people aren't responding in kind. And of course, it feels like a lot more work than really just adding that smile. Now, there is another piece to this that we hear a lot of misconceptions around, and that's eye contact. And I think many people start much like you around, okay, lie detection. Now I get all into eye contact. Am I making enough? What's too much? Oh, I heard if I look away, that means I'm not trustworthy, so I have to maintain eye contact. 
So what are the right balances with eye contact and how can we use it to our advantage when it comes to trustworthiness? And, and maybe what are those myths that we can dispel for our audience around eye contact? So in terms of the myth, we think that people that look away are lying or people that look away are hiding something. And that just isn't true. People look away all the time. They might be uncomfortable. They might be very comfortable, but they just don't give much eye contact. Um, in terms of how to give good eye contact, we have this um, sort of optimum square, and it's from the nose to the eyes, uh, square, triangle, sorry, from the eyes to the nose. And it's this, this is the business gaze, the eyes to the nose, and that's where we look. And then we kind of have a more social gaze, which is from the eyes to the mouth. And then that's where we look sort of in a social setting. And then we have the intimate gaze, which is the eyes down to the chest. So you wouldn't look from the eyes to the chest in a business setting. Like you should also avoid in a business setting looking from the eyes to the mouth. You stay within that business gaze. So that's kind of a good paradigm of where to look in different settings. But in terms of how much to look, I don't think there is, you know, a perfect amount of eye contact to give. Also because people differ in how much eye contact they like to receive. So give good eye contact, you know, regular eye contact, but don't stare at somebody because that makes them uncomfortable and just recognize you know do they look like I'm making them uncomfortable by looking at them too much and if they they start to look a bit nervous you know, just move your gaze away you don't have to completely turn and ignore them but just you know flick to other things and show them you're listening and then kind of flick to other things and show them you're listening again so just you have to figure out how they're comfortable and how you're comfortable as well because if you're thinking, okay, eye contact, eye contact, eye contact, you're probably going to miss the fact that they're like, why are they giving me so much eye contact? <laughs> it's uncomfortable. So don't think too much about it. I would just stay within the correct gaze frame and then go with what feels comfortable. And that is as much attention really that I give to eye contact because I think it really is, again, just that simple that we look for this perfect amount or perfect equation for things and we overcomplicate it and then struggle to do it perfectly and we've heard in the past that the direction that you're looking when you're breaking eye contact is accessing different brain cues is there any science around the direction that you're actually looking when you break eye contact no <laughs> no i mean we do look in different directions when we access different parts of our brain but i mean we use a hundred percent of our brain you know, most of the time there isn't a part of our brain that isn't active at some point. Um, so I think that sits within that myth of, you know, we use 10% of our brain. That same, you know, we um, if we're creative, we only use the right side or the left side. All of these things, same with, you know, we look in a certain direction when we're lying. They all fit within that paradigm of just myth that, you know, again, don't think too much into them because there really isn't any science um, backing them. Now, with all of this research that you've done on nonverbal communication, how have you brought it into your life? Is there anything that you've changed or now utilized from the research you've done in your nonverbal communication? Yes, so I am not a touchy-feely person at all. I, touching has always made me very uncomfortable, but touching is something we have evolved to do. It makes people feel very safe. So because I know that that is um, something that makes people feel safe. Same with, you know, open gestures. I was always a very nervous person, very, very closed off. I didn't really like being, you know, touched at all. I did not like touching other people. But I learned how powerful these are. So I, I learned to get comfortable with them. And it took me time because, like you said, it's not a toolkit. You have to actually get comfortable. So I, I implemented what I know that that makes other people more comfortable because you know isn't that what we want when we interact with people we want to make them feel comfortable we want to make them feel good we want to make them leave the conversation thinking so nice to talk to that person I felt really good I felt safe so if you know that you do behaviors that aren't perceived well but they're comfortable to you try and learn to do the other behaviors learn to get comfortable with the stuff that makes other people feel safe and you know anything is it's practice and it will become a habit eventually and now I'm a lot more touchy-feely I'm very open I have my hands out a lot and I'm always kind of you know, arms out and things like that and you just 
know, eventually one day you think, oh, I don't even think about it anymore. That's the best feeling in the world when it becomes who you are and how you act normally without having to be so conscious about it. But it does take some conscious effort to get there. And we all have these. I mean, that's the the beauty of nonverbal communication is we have conditioned ourselves to self-soothe. Maybe it's looking at your phone. Maybe it's putting a drink in front of your chest. Maybe it's rubbing your stomach or grabbing your neck. And yeah, you may have to break a few bad habits, but this is something that you can practice with everyone. Every interaction is an opportunity for you to practice your nonverbal communication. And, and now with the power of Zoom, we can do it in a more controlled environment like our home, our office, et cetera. Yeah, and we can record ourselves. And it's very uncomfortable. Well, I find it uncomfortable seeing myself do anything. If you watch a video or a talk of yourself, it just it makes you cringe. But you have to learn to kind of get comfortable with that. Do a talk and record yourself doing it. Or have an interaction with someone, record it. And then assess your behavior after and look at what did you do and how were they reacting to it? Or what did you do wrong? What did you do well? And learn to get comfortable with your own behaviors and um, assessing yourself. Well, that's the best part about it because the cringe actually means it's impactful. So we just had a group of military special operators through the program and they have great body language. They've obviously taken great care of themselves to be in great shape. But even watching themselves on video, they were cringing. They couldn't believe that they looked and appeared that way. And the second round of video work, instant change. Because they consciously, seeing yourself, feeling that cringe, you want to make the change versus me saying, hey, you're not smiling enough, Abby. Internally, you're like, AJ, I'm definitely smiling. But when you see yourself on video that you're not smiling, it just carries much more weight with your subconscious mind to make that change. Yeah, because you think when you see yourself, you can put yourself in that other person's perspective and say, you know, I feel this way seeing myself. My God, that is how they must feel interacting with me. And that's not how I want another person to feel. I want them to feel good and comfortable and not cringe. So I think when we watch it and cringe, we just have to think, okay, do I want someone else to feel that way? And what can I change so that they don't? Exactly. Such a valuable lesson. Well, we love asking every guest what their X factor is, what personality trait skill set makes you so unique, Abby. Um, I think my ability just to keep going, no matter how many times I fail at things, I would just keep going. The amount of failed studies um, before I got my PhD, I had loads of rejections. You just keep going. Failure really just means, you know, one less failure to go until I get where I want to be. I love that. Where can our audience find more about the work that you've done, the research that you have? So you can find uh, my profile on my website, which is abbymorono.com. You can find me on Twitter, which is Abby J. Morono, or on LinkedIn, which is Abby Morono. Thank you so much for stopping by. We really appreciate all these great insights on nonverbal communication. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.